This is where San Francisco comedy began. The Purple Onion and The Hungry Eye on Broadway were the testing grounds for the Bay Area's first wave of comic genius. They've been closed down for some time now, but back in the early 60s, you could have stopped by on a good night and caught some promising unknowns, like Lenny Bruce, Mort Saul, Phyllis Diller, or the Smothers Brothers. Hi, I'm Dave Garrison, and I'm here to introduce you to a new generation of San Francisco comedy talent. You see, when the Purple Onion closed, it was the end of one era of San Francisco comedy, but not the end of comedy itself. All over the city, new clubs are springing up, and new performers are carrying on the uninhibited tradition of San Francisco comedy. But why San Francisco? What is it about this city that makes it such a magnet for comedy talent? Nobody knows for sure, but from the raucous days of the Barbary Coast, through the psychedelic trips of the 60s, to the anything goes 80s, San Francisco has been a town where it's okay to be, well, different. For a lot of people with crazy dreams and schemes, it's the last stop on the edge of the continent. Living in this city gives you a crazy perspective on life. A perspective that translates into some of the funniest, most irreverent comedy you've ever heard. Welcome to the San Francisco Comedy Sampler. I've been doing a lot of driving lately. I uh, did a gig in Stockton the other night. And I think I've seen probably the biggest optimist in the world. I was driving across the Bay Bridge. I see a guy at the foot of the Bay Bridge, garbage bag, open sores, <laughs> holding a sign that says, Maine, okay? <laughs> Hop right in, asshole. Come on, I want a disease. Let's spend the week together. Come on, jump right in here. I survived by my wits, so you might say that I'm ready to go any day now. <laughs> I don't know. I've had lots of strange jobs besides working in restaurants. I drove a cab in San Francisco a long time. Very interesting job. You know, you get people getting in the cab saying things like, hey, buddy, can you take me to the Connie Francis Hotel, please? <laughs> Wait a minute, you must mean the St. Francis Hotel, don't you? You mean she died? This kind of shit happens all the time, all right? I got a guy, came in one night, gets in the cab, I go, where to, buddy? He goes, none of your fucking business. <laughs> I would love to be rich. I would love to be rich and famous and powerful so I can crush all the people that have hurt me all my life. Thanks so much. Just something I look forward to. I love you all, I really do, and I mean that. I love to party, you're a party in crowd, but uh, Keith Richards, here's a guy who's had his blood changed three times, okay? <laughs> he's had every known sexual disease you can think of. And he's been playing rock and roll music 20 years. But that's not the amazing thing. The amazing thing to me is after 20 years of this kind of lifestyle, Keith Richards still looks this good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Can you get this on the cameras right here? Yeah. How many people think the term death warmed over was invented for this guy right here? <laughs> Possibly the ugliest fucking show business. I don't know what you think. I remember when I was a school crossing guard, I really wanted to get into comedy then. I did, I did. I used to stop people, give them tickets, take them out, give them body searches. They got pissed. I was seven years old, you know, it was nuts. I was really accident prone as a kid. You know, I'd walk into the house like this. Hey, Ma, I got a rake in my head. <laughs> my mother would always react the same way, but my father, he was a tough guy. He'd just sit there, you know? You got a rake in your head? Come here. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Stop whimpering. When I was your age, I used to walk around with two rakes in my head. And they only cost a nickel. He was a tough guy, my dad. He really was. My father was a comedian. He was. Henny Ferrucci. Maybe you heard of him. He was a <laughs> famous Borscht Belt comedian. I didn't have to say grace before dinner. I had to do five minutes of original material. It was really a sick thing. After dinner, we'd go out in the backyard, throw the one-liners back and forth, you know? <laughs> Take my wife! It was kind of a wild thing. It really was, but... Another influence on me was Lenny Bruce. I wanted to be just like Lenny, I really did, when I was eight years old. So I went out, got addicted to heroin. It was kind of crazy. <laughs> Started going out with strippers, really fucked up my life, it did. I couldn't hold down the paper route anymore. It pissed my parents <laughs> off. Ended up on Kid Row. It was kind of a sick thing, it really was. Serious? Uh, I think tonight I was pretty serious on stage, yeah. Uh, it's probably a, more of a serious set tonight, I think. And I, I like to get serious on stage now and then, and just, just to throw people off. They're expecting laughs, but <laughs> what the heck, I give them something different, and that's what it's all about. I picked this up from Red Cross. Safety and survival in an earthquake. 
I thought I'd, you know, point out a few of these tips to you because what the heck? We just had the earthquake up in uh, Cunnilingus, whatever the hell that town is up there. I don't know. <laughs> Stupid name like that, it should have an earthquake. What can I say? But I picked this up, and this is separated into three sections. They tell you what you should be doing before the earthquake, and they suggest that you have earthquake drills. Now, how many people do this? <laughs> I do this. I run around my house shaking all my furniture, you know, knocking my books off the shelf. It's kind of a wild thing. Last week, I really got into it. I blew up my furnace, okay? My neighbor must have been practicing, too, because while I was buried under the rubble, he came over and looted my house. It was really sick, but... Uh, then they tell you what you should be doing during an earthquake, and this is an easy one. We're all gonna be shitting in our pants. Can I see some hands right here? <laughs> Maybe not, all right. But my favorite tips are what to do after an earthquake. These are things people don't talk about. And this is word for word. The first thing they say to do after an earthquake, do not spread rumors. <laughs> They often do greater harm following disasters. Now, I always thought it was the flying glass and the power lines that were gonna get you. I guess it's those nasty rumors, huh? Mike, you hear what Bob's been saying? No, what? Ah! <laughs> this is word for word. Take my, if this sucks, call up Red Cross, all right? Thank you. No, do not go sightseeing. This is after the earthquake, okay? Guys, let's drive over to Coy Tower. <laughs> oh, it's in the backyard. We'll save the gas, no problem. Okay, check your chimney for cracks and damages. Now, this is, this is the first thing I'm doing after the quake. I don't know about you. If I didn't have a chimney, I'd check someone else's because this is the first thing you gotta do. Honey, forget the kids. Let's check this chimney over here. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute, there's a dead guy in a red suit up here and some reindeer. I don't understand this, honey. <laughs> Maybe not, all right. But my favorite one of all is use outdoor charcoal broilers for emergency cooking. Now, I don't know about you folks, but there's nothing like a 10-point quake to put me in the mood for some barbecue, huh? Actually, I'm really nervous. Not only because of like, the lights and the camera and everything, but um, I'd like to get this out in the open right away. I'm ovulating. <laughs> and it just happened as I was coming downstairs, and I thought, well, everything's going just fine. I feel like you know, I wore the right clothes, and I, I felt good, and then I thought, <laughs> What else could go wrong? Then while I'm having my period, I like to stay in bed for about 10 days. And this is followed by a week of postmenstrual depression. So I have about three good days a month, though, actually. I usually like to relax and get stoned, and then I become very paranoid about money and death. So this is sort of the cycle that we, we live in. Other times I like to eat a lot of carbohydrates and just stand in front of the mirror naked. This makes me feel very good. And then I throw myself on the bed and start leafing through Vogue and have an attack of low self-esteem. I first found out I was funny. Gosh, it's hard to say it was so long ago. I think uh, probably when I was born because I looked funny. Do you look at these magazines, Vogue? I guess we can call them periodicals, kind of women's books. They have these big, thick ones. I wonder why I buy these. You know, I always tell myself, well, I'm a comedian. I should, you know, keep up on these things. But uh, it, it, always, it strikes me funny the way the models look in there because you know they make a lot of money. They make about six, seven hundred dollars an hour at least. I'm sure probably more. But they look pissed off. I mean, they're like, they're always like that. It's like they're pissed off. They're craving sex. So it's like, and then when they're excited about something, they look like this. I never get that anxious about anything, you know. It's hard to say uh, what it's like to be a woman in comedy because uh, I've never been a man. Um, but I suppose it is difficult. I think it is a little more difficult because we were trained um, to be more like hostesses uh, to the world. Good evening. Welcome to the 11 o'clock news. I guess uh, the story tonight is that darn weather. Gosh, can you tell us about it, Dick? Can I ever? How high is the water, mama? I guess it's fine if you're a duck. Well, I'm looking here at my map, and I've got to put a big black cloud over the entire San Francisco area. Moving over here to the Midwest, talk about a wind chill factor 40 below. She goes, <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could put a big picture of the sun over the San Francisco area, don't you? <laughs> I always think, you know, do they really, they're so witty, you know, do they just think of this stuff off the top of their head, you know? And then if there isn't a disaster to report, they will record what might occur in the event of a disaster. You know, of course, we have the earthquake. We'll be hearing about this for, you know, probably about three months. They were, like, delving into everything about the earthquake. They, in fact, they even said, there will be no toad festival this weekend in Koalinga. <laughs> we'll have that story in five minutes. 
that if there isn't a disaster, they will report what might occur in the event of a disaster. It's usually the woman on the scene, Van, I'm here in San Leandro wondering what would happen if this huge condominium complex were to explode? <laughs> this East Bay family of five would be blown to bits and they're frightened by that notion. <laughs> Little family going. <laughs> or they had a special on crime in Marin. Did you, did you see this? This is, this is if crime never occurred in Marin County. So they had a big special on it all week. What, what crimes occur there? Then I'm here in Mill Valley, Marin County, where earlier today, a resident was accosted, stripped of his aura, and brutally rolfed. <laughs> there were several witnesses to this senseless act of violence, said one horrified man, I can't believe something like this could happen with the moon in Pisces. <laughs> so, I found out later, uh, that I was actually born with breasts. This is true, I was a medical wonder. And uh, my mother told me this later when I was about 10. So I, I guess that's when I first realized that I was funny. Hello, Nora. <laughs> this is your mother. I found out how that little tart weaseled her way into your brother's life. <laughs> she walked up to the cocktail party and she said, I wanna fuck you. Mom, do you have the hiccups or something? Or... She walked out in the parking lot. She fucked him in the parking lot. <laughs> then they went to his office. She fucked him in his office. Now they're living together. I think they're fucking. Mom, yeah, that's nice, but I have to go now. Yes, I'm fucking. Bye-bye. <laughs> Things you'd like to say. I think in, in the sense of just the, uh, the idea of feminine versus masculine, uh, a feminine person is not one who, uh, who steps on people's toes. She usually doesn't go first and that's sort of ingrained in, in your psyche. My sister actually is, uh, is my favorite phone caller because we were very close uh, when we grew up and uh, she always finds something that she wants to confess to me so she likes to call me at about two in the morning to do this, you know, and get on the phone, she's like, Hi Nora, it's Mary. Hi. I had something on my mind I just kind of wanted to get off and... Remember that doll you had? Your favorite doll? I hated that doll. I, I hated your doll. I know it's sick, but I did I just couldn't take it. You spent all your time with her. You didn't have any time for me, so I took it and threw it on the laundry chute. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay, Mary. I'm the one that shot your hamster. Just a few moments to remind everyone here tonight that we have a few tickets left for the Berkeley Lesbian Ballet, The Nutcracker which will be this Friday night, $3 at the door, $2 for altered males. <laughs> and while you're in Berkeley, you'll want to stop in at Elroy's Barbecue and First Baptist Church, where not only do they have the best ribs in town, but they take them next door to the church and make women out of them. Wow, with the wildest sauce in town. Ask about the three alarm deal. The way I found out I was funny was because I was thrown out of Catholic school by a tough nun who told my father that I was a comedian. When I came home, he had to look it up in the dictionary to find out what it was, and he condoned it instantly. You know, people come to me and say, who are you? I said, I am Just Pierre. They say, Just Pierre who? I say, Just Pierre. <laughs> but with you, I can learn some language tonight. Would you like to learn some French? Yeah. Just a little, we French. Just a wee oui, wee oui, French. We. <laughs> oui. Follow along in your books as we learn a few phrases in French tonight. Mow the lawn. Coup de grace. Coup de grace. Go to a gymnasium. Je ne spa. Je ne spa. Shall we cruise the Castro? Cherchez la femme. Cherchez la femme. Feminist fundraiser, laissez-faire, laissez-faire. <laughs> Would you like to go to bed with a wild man? Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? Sasquatch, Sasquatch. <laughs> Sir, your zipper is open. C'est si bon, c'est si bon. <laughs> we'll be learning more French later on, and German, the only language designed for people to spit on each other in polite conversation. How do I survive? 
First, I seek shelter. After that, liquid, something to parch, <laughs> something for my parched lips, and then build a fire. After that, I find a woman, bring her into the... Coming soon from Lucasfilms, in a galaxy far, far away, in the distant future, after the fall of the Jedi Knights, there was only one group that could stand up to Vader. Old Jewish women in rocket ships. <laughs> Revenge of the Yenta Knights. <laughs> too fast, I'll never catch him. <laughs> I broke a nail, I hate this tub of balls. Can we get a Buick? <laughs> Wish old Rabbi Kenobi was here. Mel! What? Listen to your feelings. Learn to use some schmaltz. Okay. <laughs> oh, such a deal, two for one. Trying to make it as a woman in comedy has so many in onboard inherent fraught problems that, oh God, you wouldn't imagine. First of all, if you're devoid of any of the female genitalia as I am, it's a bitch, I'm telling you. Dates become very confusing. I should mention right, right away though that UCLA has declared absolutely now that women are multi-orgasmic and they say that they can have eight to 10 orgasms in a row. Imagine eight to 10 orgasms in a row. Use this number for comparison only. Your orgasms may be less. Californian highway <laughs> orgasms substantially lower. Laughter doesn't necessarily cover hurt or sorrow. It might be a way of blowing off steam during that time or releasing some of the, some of the anxious energy. Waiting for the other shoe to drop is the best time to laugh. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? No, it's the fabulous Ginsu knife. That's right, it's the Ginsu knife. It slices, it dices, it makes mounds of julienne fries. It's the Ginsu knife. Did you know that in Japan a hand can break a board? But it can't do anything for a tomato. The Ginsu knife. It'll slice through a nail and then an orange, just in case you like nails in your orange juice. The Ginsu knife. Made out of high carbon steel, formerly the third avenue L in a fighter plane. The Ginsu knife. You know it'll slice one tomato so thin it'll last all winter. The Ginsu knife. It'll cut french fries so thin they only have one side. Papa-san, tell me story of ancient Japanese warrior. Oh, Kuko-san. Many centuries ago, fierce Japanese warrior come to South Japan to bring war with emperor. Most deadly were monks of cutlery. They study 50 years to become Ginsu warrior. <sighs> <laughs> Drinking beer tonight. I was reading in the paper they came up with a new beer today. Did anybody see this? New beer from Macho Jewish Men. Did you see this? It's called Hebrew. Did you see this? Came in two sizes, king size and circumcised. Did you see this? I have to ask my own question. Did your dad ever say this to you? Don't ever hit your brother in the head. <laughs> okay, dad. <laughs> And the reason I'm, I was reading in the paper where it's against the law to hit your kids in Sweden. Did you know this? It's against the law. So what you have to do is you have to go over the border and beat the shit out of them there and then bring them back. The line of Volvos going over the border on the weekend is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. You wait till we get to Finland, young man. What are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're going to the mountains to beat the children. Yeah, did, I did, I did, I Sorry. I wish I could be more helpful, but no, not that I know of. This woman calls her doctor and says, Doc, Doc, those hormone pills you've been giving me are too strong. He says, how do you know? She says, I have hair all over my chest. He says, that's amazing. How far down does it go? She says, all the way down my dick, and that's another thing I want to talk to you about. I feel like a schlep. I don't know any of the answers. Do you know if you listen to a shell, you can hear the ocean, right? Do you know if you listen to a dirty ashtray, you can hear L.A.? Did you know that? <laughs> Back to the dick jokes. Uh... <laughs> You like the dick jokes. Okay, if a man has a 12-inch penis in his forehead, how much of it can he see? None. His balls will hang in his eyes. Okay, you see how that... A woman in comedy. I don't know, but as soon as I get back from Sweden, I'll call you. Yeah. Want to hear a quick dirty joke or no? Yeah? yeah. Let's wait till this man passes through. You going to the toilet? It's an S meeting. Hey, hey, hey! 
I share an apartment with about, you know, 900 other people, and we all have our three-foot square space, and we pay rent, and we're not the best dressers in the world, but, yeah, we're surviving. Here's another joke. Why do Jewish women get wrinkled early? <laughs> A blowjob! Oh, sure. He likes it. He likes it. You hate it. Beat the shit out of each other. Leave me out of it, all right? I just throw him up for suggestions. <laughs> you back? Okay, no problem. The burning stop? I've got an attitude. <laughs> it's my fucking job. <laughs> Does anybody here wear designer jeans? Because a friend of mine bought a pair. They designed them into a eunuch. So uh, I was a little hesitant about buying a pair myself. So I bought a pair designed by somebody I could trust. They're designed by Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> Except every time I get excited, I get a geodesic dome in my drawers. Which is... I want to be so rich, when I go skiing, I don't go up the hill, they dig one underneath me. Yes, I hope to be rich. I grew up in suburbia. Anybody grew up in suburbia with the front lawn and the shrubbery? And your mom was always saying to your dad, mow the lawn, trim the shrubbery, mow the lawn, trim the... Well, my daddy wasn't into that, so what he did was he put in plastic shrubbery, right? We had the only front lawn you had to dust, you know what I mean? The sprinkler system used to throw a liquid pledge. It was the honest thing. Except during the heat wave, it melted. Thank God it molded itself beautifully into dinette furniture. <laughs> My mother took this as a theme, did the whole house in early McDonald's. It was a great place to go. You know, he who has the most toys when you die wins. I read that on John's t-shirt, and I believe it. Hello, parents of America. Have you decided against that extra child because of the hassles of feeding, cleaning, and loving your new baby while the old one's still running around smearing jelly on the woodwork? Well, we here at ChemLab Corporation have a product just for you. Hey, why mess with the trials and tribulations of making babies in the bedroom when you can make them twice as easily in the bathtub with new Miracle Kitty Clone and its special additive DNA? Here's how it works. You take your favorite kid and stick him or her in a nice warm tub. Yes, then add a single tablet of new Miracle kitty clone with its special additive DNA and stand back for the fun. Before your eyes, the siblings start <laughs> popping up. Each one identical, each one a golden angel. And when you give one a command, why, they'll all respond because DNA builds 12 bodies one way. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Just listen to this. Come on in for dinner, dear. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. So make people and influence friends. DNA, a division of Helix Corporation. <laughs> I'm a sick man using comedy as a shield. Now get away from me! It's done! Interview's over! So far, you've had a chance to see some of the very best of San Francisco's new generation of comedy talent. You know, as a group, these comics really vary off stage. Some are class clowns, but we've also seen a few Walter Mitty's and Clark Kent's. People who on the surface seem the least likely candidates for the extroverted lifestyle of a comic. There's no common denominator, just a burning desire to make you laugh. So don't go away, there's lots more to come. I'm still feeling a little bit weird. I, don't know, I drove in from the north and uh, like you said, I drive over the bridge a lot and uh, I don't know, does anybody else do this? Tell me the truth. When you're driving, and you're approaching a toll booth, do you try and find some cool music on the radio so the toll taker think you're cool? <laughs> you do that? Because I do that. I don't know why these are the guys I want to impress. I guess it's because they're so wild, aren't they? Oh yeah, toll takers are a bunch of crazy guys. You never know what they're going to do. They might say thank you, and then again, they might not. <laughs> Just one time, though, I'd like to go lean down and say, thank you. Hey, nice tunes. <laughs> what I find funny, I find funny the things that uh, people do out of self-consciousness, that, things that people do that if they could climb out of themselves and look down at what they were doing, they would find absurd. Speaking of cars and driving, you ever do this? You drive down to the store, you want to leave something in your car, but you don't want anyone to know, so you try to get tricky. You take like a sweater or a coat, you cover it up. You think that trick's a thief? Like he's gonna walk up and look in your car and go, hmm, nothing in there. Just this one thing covered by a sweater. It's a sweater shaped like a tape deck. I think it just makes it fun for him. You know, you can say, hey, should I take what's in the Cadillac or go for what's behind the sweater?
And again, about cars, a friend of mine, he's rebuilding the engine of his car. So he's got this manual. It's like a thousand pages, like this thick. He's got to refer to this thing all the time. So just for curiosity, I looked in this manual, and I looked on page number one, step number one, and what do you think it said there? It said, lift up the hood. <laughs> <laughs> lift up the hood. I'm thinking, hey, if that's step number one, step number two should be, if you need step number one, you shouldn't be around the engine of a car. <laughs> I'm thinking, how does someone so obvious get into a manual like that? I thought, maybe they put out the manual without that advice and they got complaints. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I'm using your book here, How to Rebuild the Engine of a Car, but I'm having a problem. Yeah, I can't seem to get my tools through the grill. I think the best laughs come from that recognition of seeing themselves in a, in a situation that they've found themselves in before. And uh, I find that not necessarily the biggest laughs, but the best laughs come from that kind of material. Since I've been performing on stage, people come to me, they say, Rob, where does a star like you buy his clothes? <laughs> I tell them I am a Mervyn's kind of guy. I love that store Mervyn's. You know, you go into Mervyn's, you feel like you got some money. Now that's not the best part. The best part is if you take those clothes home, you wear them twice, you got something to wash your car with. <laughs> what I hate, I hate those department stores. You know, the kind where you go in, then if you decide you don't want to buy anything, you can't get out. They set it up so you have to walk by the checker. It's kind of an awkward moment. You feel like you owe them an explanation. You walk by, it's like, oh, hi. <laughs> yeah, I wanted... Uh, College ruled binder paper, but uh, you only had standard. <laughs> you can duck under those bars they set up, but that's humiliating. You have people looking at you and stuff. You really want to get out with no humiliation at all. You got to make like a token purchase, something like a pack of gum. But that's pretty obvious, and the guy will still ask you that last question Is that going to be all? <laughs> with this? <laughs> Nah, I'm going to get a whole bunch of stuff. I just said I'd bring it up one at a time. Basically, I try to please myself first. If I find that the material is funny, I find that I can present it uh, funny. And uh, so the first person I try to satisfy is myself, and I have, I believe, real high standards. Commercials are weird anyway, aren't they? I ever see these ones where they try to get old people to buy fade cream to get rid of their age spots? I don't understand the rationale here. Like, if you get rid of the spots, no one's gonna know you're old. <laughs> so, who's that young chick with all the wrinkles? <laughs> Come on, if they tell the truth, it's more like, hey, old guy, where's your spots? <laughs> What'd you do, fade them off? <laughs> How about the ones with the paintings? You ever see these? Starving artist sale. The warehouse is overstocked. You ever wonder why that warehouse is overstocked? And these are the paintings Holiday Inn won't buy. They come on, they say, no painting over $39. If there's one thing that makes me want to hang ugly paintings on my wall, it's getting them cheap. I just want to say that uh, I hope Johnny Carson sees this and realizes his job is really in jeopardy. And uh, I hope he doesn't feel bad about that because, you know, he's had a long time and it's really my turn. And I think he'll understand that. I'd like to go back to childhood a little bit. My parents had some weird ideas about raising kids. My mother especially used to spank me for whatever happened in the house simply because I was the oldest. Anything went wrong, automatically my fault, I get the spanking. She'd say, Robbie, you should have known better. You're the oldest. Who else but parents could come up with this kind of rationale? <laughs> could you see this? Oh. All right, you guys, we got you surrounded. Send out McCluskey. He should have known better. He's the oldest. She had a line for everything. She said, Robbie, don't you know I only spank you because I love you and I care about you. Wouldn't a simple card do? I always felt like, once you give me the belt, let me show you a little affection. <laughs> My dad, there's a guy, I just had a birthday not too long ago. I turned 25 years old, 
pretty excited about this. You know, 25, it's a milestone, quarter of a century. I go home, they have a little party for me. Everybody gets me a little something. What do you think my father gets me? My father gets me a bathroom scale. <laughs> what a subtle guy, huh? <laughs> and what gets me is then he says, Robbie, I'm just trying to help. Like, I'm going to get on this scale and go, Whoa, look! I'm overweight! I never knew! If I had just had this scale! I'm going to get him back for Christmas. He's getting a case of deodorant. That's right. Uh, I'm a gal. I'm a babe. I'm a woman. I am. And because of that, I can look at a color and I can say, you know, that's a very interesting shade. It's kind of uh, not really an orchid or a violet, is it? But not quite as deep as a maroon or a burgundy, huh? <laughs> but it is an interesting shade. Not really an orchid or a fuchsia, not even a magenta. It's more of a raspberry. Well, really, it's a plum, isn't it? And a man can look at that same color and just go, it's fucking purple. <laughs> the subtle differences between men and women. Thank you. If some of you are, are like looking at me, studying me, maybe wondering what the story is, why I look familiar, I'm gonna clear this up right away. I don't want you to have to dwell on this one too long. Okay, the reason I look kind of familiar to you is because my dad, uh, my dad is Mick Jagger, my mom's Haley Mills, okay? <laughs> it's a deadly combo. <laughs> what is it like to be a woman in comedy? It's hell, hell. <laughs> Sheer unmitigated hell. I can't think of anything that could be worse. Every day I wake up, please God, make me a man so life will be easy. I hate it. I live in San Francisco now, uh, where men are always unexplainably drawn to the man I'm with. Um, See, I, I was like the last wave of those people from the 70s that went to college, like in a major, where they could like make the world a better place. So I was an urban designer, and I did that. I like, you couldn't make the world a better place. So I said, okay, well, let's try to like narrow it down instead of entire cities, we'll work on individuals at a time. It's hard to be in love these days. It's hard to just find friends. I have what I, I have an entire theory of being totable as a person. What this means is you're able to be carried places by other people, right? You know this, you got some friends you can take anywhere, no problem. You never think twice about it. They fit in, they adapt to any situation, right? They're very, very totable. Then there's those people that aren't that totable. Do you know what I'm talking about? You can't take them in and you think about, well, will they fit in? Will it be all right? Am I going to be uncomfortable? Do you know what I'm talking about? There are people that are just fun in bed, but not fun at mom and dad's for dinner. Do you know these kind of people at all? <laughs> they exist. I found out, I was very hurt, I found out a good friend of mine didn't think I was particularly totable lately. Because he said to me, Susan, you wait here in the car. I'll be back in a couple of hours. <laughs> Great, could you crack the window? I'd appreciate it. It was a total fluke. I was living with a man and he moved away and I answered an ad in a paper and I went and I applied for, to be in a in an improv group and I knew they would say, no, what experience do you have? And I say, none, and they say, no, and, and I say, fine, I was just testing you. And they said, come on down. And then I was in the group, and then I had to perform. And then, one th and then I was in comedy clubs performing, and I thought, well, God, I should do more. And I did, and then people paid me money, and now I'm stuck. Maybe the most, uh, one of the most awkward times in your life is that first time you make love with somebody. Because you can read about it in books, you can see it in movies. You can have people tell you about it. Nothing's the same as your first time. I remember mine. I don't want to brag. I thought I was kind of a groovy, happening kind of babe, okay? <laughs> I was. Really. I was, you know, you're supposed to be so tense. I thought I was, you know, pretty relaxed. We were having some wine, some low light. I suddenly saw my opportunity. I thought, hey, Susan, you are a babe of the 80s. <laughs> be aggressive. <laughs> so at just the right moment, I said, why don't we just go to bed? I said that. <laughs> and everything was fine. We went into the bedroom. I'm still really relaxed till I laid down on the bed and I went stiff as a board. He said, relax. <laughs> I am relaxed. No, you're not. Look at you. I am relaxed. Just do it. <laughs> it was an incredibly romantic time for all of the people in the room then. It was great. <laughs> I've thought about this recently, actually. A couple bad nights and you're, you're off on some jag thinking about what you would do if you weren't a comedian. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't know, it changes from night to night. I'm thinking, I can't do the waitress stuff anymore. I can't do the regular job stuff. That, I'm, I'm ruined for life. I'll never be able to do that ever again. I'm thinking, um, I would like to be in an Aquanaut show, you know? 
where they have the skis and everything. Now, I don't know anything about that, but it looks fun. And they have nice costumes. And you get tan. And my hair gets incredibly gorgeous when it's blonde, and little highlights like that and everything. So if I went to Florida or like Orange County or someplace where I could be an aqua, you know, like this. Don't you think that would be good? Me? And I look good in a suit, too. I do. How many people have already figured out I spend entirely too much time alone in my room? Okay. I just like to check in, check back in every once in a while. I was on a flight recently, thought I made a great observation. You notice that flight attendants are friendliest to you at the end of the flight? It's like they save it all up for that special moment when you are getting off the plane. This is when they all line up the entire flight attendant crew to give each and every individual person a special goodbye. They're so friendly then going, bye-bye, take care, bye-bye, have a good one, bye-bye, take care, see you, bye-bye, take care, you're special, bye-bye, take care, loved you, bye-bye, have a good trip, bye-bye, take care, have a nice day, bye-bye, take care, loved you, bye-bye, you're special, you're wild, bye-bye, take care, see you, bye-bye, take care, bye-bye, have a good one, bye-bye. 375 people, you know, bye-bye, take care, bye-bye, have a good one, bye-bye, see you, bye-bye, take care, bye-bye, loved you, bye-bye, you're special, bye-bye. My smile, bye-bye, take care. These women must be loads of fun at home, huh? You know? I'm going to the grocery store. Bye-bye, take care, bye-bye, have a good one, pick me up something, bye-bye, take care, loved you, bye-bye, take care, see you, bye-bye. Bye-bye, 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 bye-bye. They're disgusting. My secret fantasy is, though, to be a stewardess for just one flight. No, just so I can do the beginning flight instructions the way I think they really mean them. <laughs> Come out and go, good afternoon. Captain Lucky has asked me to inform you of the safety procedure here today. <laughs> Some air is going to drop from the ceiling, all right? Your flotation cushions are located under your seats. Your exits are located over here, over there, over here. It doesn't matter, you're going to fucking die. <laughs> then at the end of the flight, when the pressure's coming down, you know, everyone's like screaming, their ears are about to burst. Ah! Whip out from behind the curtain long enough to go, who wants gum? <laughs> Did you want to ask me how I come up with material? <laughs> visions. Sure. I have visions. Okay. I lie awake at night in my bed with everything dark, and I wait until my universal traveler, my companion, my spiritual companion comes, my guide, and says, don't do anything on dogs or cats. Come here. Do something on your mother. And then, and then, like, they tell me stuff. <laughs> I was in the van pool today, scary. It reminded me of when I was a little girl. And I, whenever I was in the passenger seat of the car, did your mom used to do this? Whenever she'd go to break the car, she'd throw her arm in front of you like this. <laughs> Irritating habit. I figure if my mother would have been a better driver, potentially today I could have one incredible bus line. <laughs> the lure of comedy is that Gosh, that one guy that comes out of the club and says, God, that was funny. God, I, I feel better. Making the world a better place. <clears throat> I love to get on that long ribbon of highway, get behind that wheel and just drive, drive, drive. Are you like that, people? Do you love to drive? Yes, I'm not talking just your in-down driving here. I'm talking your cross-country driving. Yeah, yeah, get on that road and drive, drive, drive. Anybody ever headed west out of Salt Lake City? Yeah. Out of the majestic Rockies, down, down, down into Salt Lake City, head out across those Bonneville Flats, driving, 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 cranking up that Chinook, keep on driving, driving, driving till you get to the Stuckies in Winnemucca. Oh, yeah! That's driving. Yeah, my new goal in life is to have four kids I can chauffeur around in a wood-paneled country square station wagon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where do you G-O-D damn kids want to go now? <laughs> Little League Ballet, I'll take you there. God, I love to drive. Yeah. Have a beverage caddy on the door. Thermos of hot coffee on the seat next to me and one of those 5,000 millimeter cigarettes just hanging out of my mouth. <laughs> then when everybody else in the whole house is fast asleep, get back in that vehicle, get on that long ribbon of highway and drive, drive, drive. <laughs> Keep on driving, 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 see how far I can go and still get back in time to fix some breakfast. Yeah! Whoa! God, I love to drive. Whoa. Okay, settle down. Um, nice looking crowd. Just watching you before I came up. You're all drinking, laughing, having a good time. I thought, gee, too bad they're all going to get old and die. In my mind. But, um, had kind of a big day today. Can you tell us about it? Sure. <laughs> Went over to uh, Berkeley for this lecture on nutrition titled Fiber, Nature's Broom. 
That was kind of fun. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. let me know if I do it right. I guess most of you people probably drove up here tonight, and um, lots of fun looking for a parking space on Clement Street, huh? Uh, let's put 58 Chinese restaurants in one block, very good zoning laws, and uh, so you have like a caravan of Dodge Darts going around that block for four hours, which uh, puts people in a good mood for comedy. Make me laugh, asshole! Which uh, makes our job that much easier, but uh, I do have a car, and... Uh, it's kind of an unusual car. It's a gas hog. I was getting filled up tonight, and the guy said, turn off your engine, you're gaining on me. But uh, <laughs> it is a pig, and uh, I'll tell you, um, you got to worry about getting your stereo ripped off if you live in this town, but uh, I got a foolproof burglar system now. I installed an 8-track, and uh, <laughs> not one of your high-theft items these days. Uh, in fact, last night somebody broke into my car and left two tapes. I got... Uh, <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears, and Donnie and Marie, so it was kind of a big day for me, but um, I survived by foraging for berries during the day and uh, doing stand-up at night to uh, feed my sick mental habit. When you drive around this area, you see a lot of dumb signs. Uh, I was up in Novato, there's this roadside diner, out front it says, live cooked oysters. Thought about that for a minute, then I went in and told the manager, if they can survive that, you should turn them loose, you know, it's <laughs> kind of hard to be live and cooked, and uh, freeway off-ramp, stop, go back, you're going the wrong way. Now, knowing the average California driver, he probably reads that and says, how do they know? And uh, <laughs> over in North Beach in the Big Hills, park at 90 degrees. This Cretan was running around saying, man, it never gets that warm here. I'll never be able to park. And, uh, I have never driven a cab. I have uh, taken a ride in a cab, but I've never driven a cab. So I think my life's complete. Any vegetarians in the crowd? OK, kind of a bunch of angry carnivores. Good. but. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to become a vegetarian, and I was down at Jack in the Box tonight. It's hard, you know. You see a hamburger? Well, nothing I can do for it now. <laughs> but a uh, lot, of, lot, of, lot of carnivores at these fast food places. People dripping at the counter, red meat, <laughs> like Tyrannosaurus rexes, and uh, really disgusting. And uh, I was just sitting there, and I heard this big... <laughs> I turned around. The kids had deep-fried the manager, which was kind of unusual. So there was like a six-foot onion ring with a blue badge. Hi, my name's Ed. Nice shit. <laughs> kind of different. And... Uh, they got bacon cheeseburgers now. It used to be cheeseburgers, now it's bacon cheeseburgers. It's kind of like, how many animals can we kill for one sandwich? Boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> pig, cow, chicken, anything. So it's kind of a sick world, I think. But I uh, thought I'd make the circuit. I like to hit the fast food places. Went over to Wendy's. Wendy's down at the wharf, and uh, a lot of tourists down there, you know, long lines of polyester. Just like home, wonderful. More of this, people forming conga lines and getting upset. But uh, people get real orgasmic about salad bars. They just go nuts every time they see one. It's like... A dollar seventy nine? All I can eat? Ow! 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 <laughs> Showtime! Nirvana! Pater! Gandhi! There's a god! Salad bar! In here! So Al and the rest of the family come running out of the wax museum or whatever they're doing, and it's like, you know, they don't even get past Elvis because they want those greens. And it's like, a dollar seventy nine? All I can eat? How do they do it? It's because they use a lot of lettuce, you know? A Galapagos turtle can't eat a dollar seventy nine worth of lettuce, and, uh, <laughs> Real appetizing, little kids pushing their face up against a snee shield. <laughs> thousand Islands looks like it's been there about a thousand days, you know. <laughs> Flies are practicing touch and go landings. <laughs> so might want to avoid that. Yeah. People often ask me what it's like to be a woman in comedy. Well, um, it has its pitfalls, especially during my premenstrual cycle when I'm bloated and uh, I'm a real bitch. And uh, but otherwise, it's just a beautiful thing. And uh, capital punishments in the news uh, lately. Uh, how you people feel about it? For, against? Okay, kind of a murderous, carnivorous crowd here tonight, but uh, <laughs> two views on capital punishment. Uh, one, uh, an affront to humanity or a potential parking space, depending on where you're coming from. But uh, <laughs> capital punishment got going about six years ago with the execution of Gary Gilmore in Utah. He was a guy who got picked up for uh, sodomizing the Osmonds or something productive out there. But uh, he was a guy who, when he was in prison, kept saying, shoot me, shoot me. And they finally did proving once again the squeaky wheel gets the grease. But uh, <laughs> my favorite execution was down in Texas two months ago. A guy was put to death by lethal injection. Just wondering, before they gave him the shot, do you think the doctor rubbed alcohol in his arm? Something to think about. Maybe the doctor had a sense of humor. Are you allergic to anything? Doesn't die and they file a malpractice suit, but uh, the possibilities are endless. I get my best material from, uh, from me and I have a warped outlook out in life, and uh, I like to share it with people to let them know how sick I am. Let's talk about suicide, because San Francisco leads the nation in suicide, and proudly so. 
But you know what burns my Oscar Meyer? Nobody out here does it with any creativity. You always read about these guys that are despondent, you know, they suffered some tragedy, like their girlfriend dumped them or their van wouldn't start. God, the account line wouldn't kick over. That's it. Life's too much. <laughs> so what do they do? They jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Poor taste, because like 800 people have done this. Three people jumped off the Bay Bridge. That takes a fevered mind. Uh, jump off the Bay Bridge, the Coast Guard won't even pick up the body. It's like, that guy was a loser. Let's mow the lawn. No. <laughs> won't even get the boat out. Now, if I were going to do it, I'd put a little of flair into it that Larry Brown is so famous for. Maybe go to the top of the Trans-America building, get a calliope and a pair of wax lips. Maybe a portrait of Wayne Newton under my arm and a watermelon. Roll myself off the edge. This would get you on TV, you know? Dave McElhenna had a real sincere look. Bizarre suicide, Wendy. Bizarre. I got into comedy because I got tired of being rejected by women. Uh, it used to be I could get rejected by one woman a night, but uh, now I can go out in front of as many as 200 people and get rejected, and uh, I could go for big rejection, and that's why I got into comedy. I've been kind of depressed lately. I know I mask it well, but uh, I'm getting old. I turned 26 a couple months ago. Pretty soon I'll be in a trailer park watching Over Easy, you know? Either that or sneak previews. Well, Gene, I don't understand this film. What's Fellini trying to say? Roger, you're fat. Get a new sweater. But... Uh, <laughs> my favorite shows, but uh, I'm making little observations about life as I head in my twilight years. Like, if you don't get laid a lot when you're young, you don't get laid a lot when you're old, and I uh, <laughs> figured that out by myself, and uh, bitter, oh, a tad, but uh, you gotta be dominant if you want to score. Like, walruses, one male, he gets all the females, he usually drives a Porsche, too, a uh, Targa with tusks, and votes independent, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm a wimp, but uh, I don't do real well with women. Uh, Tell you the kind of women I hang out with. The most romantic thing a woman ever said to me in bed was, I hope you're not a cop. <laughs> now I have my own parking space in the Mustang Ranch, painted green, five minutes zone. Ba boom, but I'll tell you. Are we in show business? Okay, cut tape and roll. Stop. You have been a good group. Uh, sometimes in comedy you get a rough group. Uh, two weeks ago down at the punchline, I had a friendly group. It was like every bowling alley in Hayward and Fremont had shut down and uh, they all gravitated over there. Real friendly people. I hate you, you made me think. And uh, <laughs> tying me to the back of their pickup trucks. I wish them all a long, painful death. But uh, you've been good. If you like me, the name's Larry Brown. If you didn't, we both have something in common. And uh, good night. Well, that's our show. Hope you enjoyed it. For those of you who live in San Francisco, this is newspaper. Good for wrapping fish and lining bird cages. For the rest of you, this is the pink section of the Sunday San Francisco Chronicle. This is a weekly newspaper called The Bay Guardian, and this is another one called Just for Laughs. Grab one of these when you roll into town and look for clubs with names like The Ha Ha A Go Go, The Punchline, Hobbs Pub, and The Other Cafe. You'll find all the who, what, where's, including special events like an annual day of comedy in Golden Gate Park. and. San Francisco comedy competition where each year's best jester becomes king. And keep an eye peeled for our performers. Mike Ferrucci, Nora Dunn, Marty Higgins, Steve Kravitz, Rob Becker, Susan Healy, and Larry Brown. Even if they become big stars, feel free to walk up to them and say, I saw you on the Comedy Sampler. I'm Dave Garrison. See you at the comedy clubs.